September 22nd, 2013. The DNA of God. Let's pray. Father, anoint your people with eyes to see and ears to hear. Anoint your servant with your word as we empty ourselves, vessels for your use, and yield now to your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, and the saints say in agreement, Amen. Satan, we bind you, all principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits in outer space, all entities not of the Holy Spirit, all spirits not of the Holy Spirit, all of your works and efforts which we curse at the roots and cast out and down as vain thoughts and imaginations in the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus, we bind up and off all retaliations, counterattacks, judgments, wraths, revenge, or reprisals in any way, manner, or form against any of us or our loved ones, born or unborn, our descendants, spouses, children to a thousand generations and beyond according to the Abrahamic covenant promises and decree all such retaliations or counterattacks immediately, permanently, and perpetually forbidden and bind them up and off immediately, permanently, and perpetually, all in Christ Jesus' name and the saints say in agreement, amen. Okay. Now that we've done our homework, we can talk about today's topic. We have been talking about the DNA of God. And in our introductory session, uh, in the last session, uh, we explored what DNA is and developed an understanding of what DNA is. A lot of people talk about DNA and they know it as a word, but they really don't know what it's about. And so it's important for us to understand what it's about, what its qualities are, why it's important to God, why it's important to us. And once we realize that, then we can understand, and only then can we understand why Satan wants to corrupt it, why Satan wants to destroy it. You see? And so now we get into that phase of our teaching where we're going to have a look at that. We're going to see what Satan planned to do with the DNA of God's creation and why he wanted to do it. One of the first things that we must understand about uh, the fallen angels, including Satan, is that they are first and foremost genetic gods with a small g. They are genetic gods with a small g. And the war between good and evil, or as the Dead Sea Scrolls refer to it, the war be, uh, between the sons of darkness and the sons of light mentioned in the Copper Scroll, uh, also mentioned in the Holy Scriptures as the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. That war is first and foremost a genetic war. It isn't just a war in which evil is trying to dominate over good. It is a war in which evil is trying to destroy all that God programmed in the creation in order to steal God's glory from him, to corrupt his entire creation. Well, the entire creation is engineered and operated by DNA. DNA is what makes a person what it is. DNA is what makes a creature what it is. I'm talking about physically, the, crea the physical creation. And so if Satan could corrupt that and disrupt that, it would both interrupt God's plan for the creation and it would also destroy the creation as God gave it in order to steal God's glory and corrupt it. 
it's an act of warfare, isn't it? And what does that mean? It means that we are at war. We have had a previous teaching in this congregation uh, given, uh, I think, about a year or two years ago uh, that went on for a number of weeks that was called the Invisible War, in which we went into this in much more detail. But, uh, and that hopefully will be up on the Internet uh, in the very near future, if you want to listen uh, to listen to it and view it. Uh, so the first thing we have to understand as you watch these slides today, what will unfold to you is the nature of the war, what Satan was doing against God. And so this is what Bible scholars refer to as the war of the ages. The war of the ages. And indeed it is. It's been going on for millions of years, if not billions or even trillions of years. We don't know. And it continues to go on. But the beautiful thing about it is that it is going to end very, very soon. Glory to God. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> Ecclesiastes says all things have their season and a time for every purpose under heaven. And God has made the decision that the time for Satan's purpose is coming to an end very quickly. And because he's under strong delusion along with all of those in his kingdom, he has the idea that at the present time, with the coming of the new world order, his kingdom will reign on the earth and is finally coming into its own. And that is a strong delusion that God has permitted. Why? Because the scripture shows very clearly and prophetically that Satan's kingdom is coming to an end very rapidly. Don't be worried about the new world order it's coming rapidly to a close and is already on the decline. And it is going to be closed down very, very, very soon. Amen? Give God the glory. Amen. Okay. Let's have a look at what happened that started this war. And once we have a look at what happened that started this war, I want to take you over the next several sessions uh, through history to show you what it has to do with us today. What does it have to do? We have to answer these questions. What does it have to do with us today? What does it have to do with the second coming of Christ? Is there any relationship to aliens and UFOs? And what is the connection if there is? You're going to be shocked because it's all in the Bible. So let's begin if we can. Would you like to set up, please? Mm-hmm. 
Please clean filter. What do we do with that? <laughs> Are we going to look at that thing for the rest of the presentation? Can you get that out of there, Ray? <laughs> it's interfering with our reading the slides. Thank you. Okay, uh, you can actually go on to the next slide. We don't need that. That's old. That's old also. Okay, you can pass that. Okay, that's where we want to be. I'm in your way here, huh? Okay, I'll. <coughs> okay, begin. In session one, we're going to discuss first the return of the star gods, the Nephilim, also referred uh, by some of the rabbis as the Nephidim. The Nephilim is are the uh, is the uh, most common uh, term used. And the word in the Hebrew has been loosely referred to as the giants because they were giants, and they were on the earth. And they were extremely large, anywhere from 9 to 15 feet tall, but there are records in the Bible of some being as large as 135 feet tall. And uh, so... Uh, they were also referred to in Scripture as men of renown, which means that they were known all over the world. And that is actually true. They were known all over the world, and some even into recent times, like uh, the 400s or 500s or 600 A.D., believe it or not. Uh, several years ago, in uh, just in uh, maybe around 2005, 2006, a large deposit of Nephilim skeletons was found in the Ohio Valley where there were these giant burial mounds and no one knew what they were. And when they unearthed them, they discovered these giant skeletons. So there was even a colony of the Nephilim living in the Ohio Valley uh, up until probably 700 A.D. or so. We don't know for sure. Uh, the Incas, the Incas of Peru, have in their legends, in their history, records of encounters with the Nephilim giants. Some of the Sioux Indians and the Cherokee have records and legends in their tribal cultures of having had encounters with the giants here in the in the uh, in uh, the United States hundreds of years ago as a matter of fact we all we said in our previous discussion if you will remember the one thing that characterized the giants or the nephilim was they had six fingers and this was even known by these primitive cultures. How many of you remember from your cowboy movies that when the cowboys came in contact with the Indians to greet the Indians, the Indians went, how? You remember that when you were a kid? Huh? Hi, O Silver, huh? Yeah. The Indians went like this when they greeted the cowboy. How? Where did that come from? Well, Indian legend says that it came from the Indians coming face to face with the Nephilim giants. And so when they went how like this and the Nephilim giants went up to greet them like this, they could count their fingers so that they could determine whether they were of the other race or not or just a tall person. That's where that came from. So there are direct connections even in our American native Indian culture with the history of the Nephilim. Say, 
Now, the key scripture to understand is Revelations 12.4. And here is how the war begins. Satan attempted to attack heaven with the fallen angels. And it says, And his tail drew a third part of the stars of the heavens. Whenever you see this word stars, it refers to fallen angels in Scripture. A third part of the stars of the heavens, and he did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, the woman here is Israel. It represents Israel. And the child is Messiah. So this was a prophetic verse which was saying that Satan went up into the heavens to attack uh, the heavens, was thrown down. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall to the ground as a bolt of lightning. That's how fast this happened the first time. And that with his tail he swung and a third of the uh, stars, the angels, fell with him. These were fallen angels to the earth. And then the next question is, what did he do on the earth? Well, the answer to that is this was the beginning of the warfare on the earth because there was a civilization on the earth before Adam and Eve. It's called the pre-Adamic civilization. And the Bible does not say that Adam and Eve were the first man and woman created by God. That is not a correct teaching. And as a matter of fact, it isn't even Bible. The Bible says that Adam and Eve were the first man and woman created in the image and likeness of God. Which means that the pre-Adamic civilization that lived on the earth before them were not in the image and likeness of God. They were something else. Well, what were they? Well... What does it mean to be in the image of God? It means to have a spirit man the way God has a spirit man. What does it mean to be in the likeness of God? To have a soul man like God has a soul man, a mind, will, and emotions. How many of you know that God has a mind, a soul? Huh? That's absolutely true. In Leviticus, he said to the Israelites, if you obey me, my soul will not abhor you. My soul will not hate you, he told the Israelites. In John 17, the night before he died, Jesus said, my soul is in anguish. Both the Father and the Son have a soul. God is a spirit. He has a soul. He's also got a spirit body. Does that shock you? He's got a spirit body. You say, well, how do you know that, Bern? Well, there's a passage uh, in Old Testament Scripture where Moses said to God, I want to see you. And God said to him, you cannot see my face, but I will walk past you and I will let you see my back. And God walked past Moses and Moses looked, and he saw his back, and I think he saw his neck. You see? How come we can't see the spirit man or the soul man? Because even though they have bodies, those bodies are made up of less dense ma matter than our bodies are. Our bodies are visually visible because the atoms are very packed close together. And atoms upon atoms are matter, and matter becomes visual. But the soul body's matter is less dense. The spirit body's matter even less dense. And the proof of that was it permitted Jesus to walk through walls after his resurrection, right? And he had a body, didn't he? 
See, a glorified body, so a spirit body. So we see that, you know, Scripture proves all these things, huh? Okay. Well, these people, the fallen uh, pre-Adamic race, had been totally and completely corrupted by Satan when he fell to the ground. This is the race mentioned in Genesis 6. Genesis 6 is a reflection on this race where the sons of God, the fallen angels, saw that the daughters of men were fair and took to themselves wives, whomever they pleased, and had children by them. That refers to this pre-Adamic race. Now, here is the point. Because they were not made in the image and likeness of God, they did not have a spirit man. Why? This race arose from these fallen angels having cohabitated with human women. That's where they came from. Now watch this. Notice, watch this. Notice, God did not create that race. Satan did. How did, how did Satan create this race? By genetic manipulation using God's uh, materials. But God was one step ahead of him. And do you know what that one step was? When God created these human woman, women, he did not put a spirit man in them because he knew what Satan was going to do. Okay? Why did he not put a spirit man in them? Because if God put a spirit man in them and the spirit man lives forever and they were pure evil, evil would coexist with good forever. See? Now watch this. God cannot go contrary to his word, can he? In Ecclesiastes, God said, all things have their season in a time for every purpose under heaven. So evil was predestined by God for a season and a purpose, not to be forever. So God cannot go contrary to his word. So God saw to it from the beginning when he permitted all of this to teach man righteousness that evil would not be permitted to exist forever so they do not get a spirit man. Praise God that they didn't get a spirit man. Amen? Glory to God that they didn't get a spirit man. Why? Because they ended up being pure evil, and guess what? God, as you're going to see throughout history, God had only one prescription for the Nephilim, man, woman, or child. And what was that prescription that God had for them? Simple, death. Death to every man, woman, and child Nephilim. Why? They were pure evil. Why else? God saves the whole creation. Huh? But he can't save them until he first gets them into the death state as a holding area and then from there into the lake of fire. Because the lake of fire and brimstone, if you've done the word study, is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the giver of life, not the torturer that the apostate church wants you to believe he is. Uh-uh, wrong doctrine. Better do your homework. That's almost blaspheming the Holy Spirit's character if it were not for ignorance. Is that true? Amen. Amen. Say, so he's got to get them with Satan, the fallen angels, the false prophet, the Antichrist, and everyone, all unsaved and unholy beings into the lake of fire. Why? 
because every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why. You think God wants that out of force? No. God wants it out of their hearts. Huh? And that's why in the book of Revelation, God says, Behold, I make all things new. Huh? Except guess what? In the original Greek of the New Testament, the word things is not there. It's, Behold, I make all new. Isn't that something? Why do you think God would do that? Well, there's only one answer. His greatest miracle is to take a fallen creation full of fallen beings as well as fragile, sinful humans in a chaotic universe. We don't, we don't know what else is going on out there. And to take it all and bring all to repentance and in divine order and heal and deliver the whole universe. So what's at stake? His glory. It's the greatest miracle that brings God the greatest glory. So people ask me, what is God doing in all this? And I say, he's telling a story. And what is the story about? Him and who he is. And so, if this is the greatest story of God, and this is uh, his greatest miracle, what is his purpose? To give the Father the greatest of glory. Okay? Does Jesus want it for himself? No. Why? Because when he's done with this, do you know what Jesus is going to do? It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, read it for yourself. Read it for yourself. In 1 Corinthians 15, 28, what Jesus is going to do is he is going to, after he's brought everything in order, he is going to turn the kingdom over to the Father. And guess what that means? That means that Jesus will no longer be King of kings and Lord of lords. Father God will. Because Jesus' whole ministry was to glorify the Father. And he will sit down at the right hand of the Father. And Father God will be King of kings and Lord of lords. And it doesn't end there. Because the book of Revelation tells us in chapter 22, that the Father and the Son with New Jerusalem, the heavenly city, will come to the earth at the end of the thousand-year reign, and David will reign from Jerusalem as king again, uh, king of Israel again. The Father will reign as the king of the universe and King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Father and the Son will walk and talk among men. Woo! Can you believe that? The King of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Father God himself, the one true God and the only God, will walk among men and fellowship with you and me. Isn't that something? And why is that? Because God is love. God is love. Let's see in the meantime what is going on and what we've got to go through to get there. Okay? Let's have the next slide. You want to take that off? Uh... Okay. The biblical story of UFOs and alien origins with the historical proofs. 2 Samuel 1, 18 and 19. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher, the beauty of Israel is slain upon your high places. How are the mighty ones fallen? That refers to the Nephilim. 
How are the mighty ones fallen? And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. Jude one fourteen. This is at the uh, second coming. Go ahead. Keys to understanding modern-day aliens and UFO phenomenon is Genesis 6, 1 to 6. I think I'm going to have to sit down here. Could you take that off for me? I, I can't see the screen. Uh, okay. Genesis 6, 1 to 6. Now, here's what happened. Watch this. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And uh, they took to themselves uh, of all which they chose. Now let's stop there for a minute because this is an important concept for you to understand. They saw the daughters of men were uh, daughters were born to human men, that the sons of God saw that they were fair. That means that means beautiful, and they took to themselves. That's abduction of all which they chose. That's kidnapping. And the, the Lord said, "My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh." Yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. Now, I want you to uh, keep, uh, I want you to keep your eyes on this word after that. There were giants in the earth in those days. This refers to the pre-Adamic civilization. And also after that, that refers to after Adam and Eve. Okay? You get that? That's very important to understand. Now, it says also, when the, it, there were giants in the earth in those days, also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, that's rape, and they had children to them. That's genetic crossbreeding. This is the first evidence in the scripture that they were genetic gods with a small g. That this was the first incidence of genetic crossbreeding. That they were DNA gods. Okay? So, notice first... What did they do? They engaged in abduction, kidnapping, and in rape. For what purpose? To achieve their end. To achieve their end. Okay? And the offspring were hybrids. They became what were called the mighty men, which were of old. Men of renown, known worldwide. Now, keep in mind this term, mighty men. When you hear this term in the Hebrew, gibberim, okay, mighty men and the uh, word giants or nephilim are interchangeable. They mean the same thing. The mighty men and the uh, nephilim mean the same thing. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. Only evil. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Now, the point I want to make here is this. When they raped these women, they bear son, the sons of God came into them and they bear children to them. And these children were a new species of intelligent beings. Man is called homo sapiens, which means man that has knowing or knowledge. These beings were homo nephilim, angel men, half angel, half man. Okay? Go ahead. 
Next slide, please. Now, you remember the word in those days? That constituted the pre-Adamic invasion and established the Nephilim civilization. How do we know this? There are two scriptures that prove that there was a pre-Adamic civilization before Adam and Eve. Those two scriptures are Genesis 1-2 and Jeremiah 4, 23-26. Let's look at them. In Jeremiah 1-2, we read, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth became without form and void. Some of your translations say was without form. It is equally, the Hebrew there, tabu abahu, is equally translated became, and more appropriate is became. Okay? In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became without form and void. In other words, God destroyed the earth through a great cataclysm, a great event. Now, this is something to really think about. In Genesis 1-1, the very first verse of the Bible, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the second verse of the Bible, Genesis 1-2, okay, it says, and the earth became without form and void. In other words, in the second verse, God destroyed all that he created. What happened? Well, most Bible scholars agree that between the first verse and the second verse of Genesis, probably millions, if not billions, of years passed. And this is the period in which that... Uh, civilization, that pre-Adamic civilization existed, and God wiped them out. That's what happened. So, what is the proof that Genesis 1-2 was the destruction of the pre-Adamic civilization? The proof is Jeremiah 4, 23-26. Jeremiah was the only prophet of the Old Testament that was permitted by God to look back in time rather than forward in time. All the other prophets were permitted to look forward in time. Jeremiah was the only one who was permitted to look backward in time. And notice what, Je what it says. Jeremiah, the Holy Spirit through Jeremiah, said in verse 23 to 26, I beheld the earth, and lo, behold, it became without form and void. The same words used in Genesis 1-2. What is the Holy Spirit telling us? He's telling us that this verse, without form and void, refers to this, Genesis 2. It became without form and void. So he is showing Jeremiah what Genesis 1-2 meant what Genesis 1-2 represented. Now notice what Jeremiah said. I saw the earth. It became without form and void. I saw the destruction. And the heavens and they had no light. I beheld, I saw the mountains and watch. They trembled, they shook, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man. Now, that's a very unusual remark to make. There is no man. Why would he make that remark when Adam and Eve were not created yet? This refers to the time before Adam and Eve. Huh? Okay. He says, I saw no man, and all the birds of the heavens fled. Now, watch this. I beheld and watched the fruitful place was a wilderness. And now here's the reason why he said, I saw no man. And all the cities thereof were broken down. There were cities on the earth before Adam and Eve. And Jeremiah saw them. Okay? And the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger, I saw no man. All the cities were torn down. God destroyed 
the pre-Adamic civilization. Now watch this. Guess what? In Ecclesiastes, God said there is nothing new under the sun. This is another proof that there were cities on the earth before Adam and Eve. Okay? In Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes, God said there is nothing new under the sun. What does that tell us? That tells us that as part of this warfare, once upon a time in an age long ago, before the creation of Adam and Eve, among these cities, if there's nothing new under the sun, among these cities, there was a Los Angeles. There was a New York City. There was a San Francisco. There was a Miami. And they were all built by Satan. There was a Rome. There was a Greece. There was an Athens. There was a Tokyo. There is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. God destroyed them all. So how come we have them today? This is Satan's rebuilding project. This is Satan's rebuilding project. And why is it his rebuilding project? Hasn't he read the back of the book? Hasn't he read the book of Revelation? Doesn't he know his faith, uh, his fate, what's going to happen to him? Oh, yes, he's read it. So why does he keep going? Because he doesn't believe it. He is under a strong delusion. Anyone who goes into sin goes under a strong delusion. Romans chapter 1, anyone who practices sin goes under strong delusion. Thinking that what they're doing is right. Uh uh. You're under strong delusion. Say, Romans 1. Satan is under strong delusion. He thinks he's going to get a victory. Say, that's why. But there's nothing new under the sun. Okay, let's continue. And then it says, and after that. What does that mean? There were, there were uh, Nephilim on the earth in those days. And then after that, remember I told you to remember that term? This constitutes the second Nephilim invasion after the first civilization was destroyed. It covers the time from the creation of Adam and Eve through the great flood at the time of Noah. Why? Genesis is a chronological book. The first great flood and destruction occurs in Genesis 1-2. That was the destruction of the pre-Adamic civilization. The flood of Noah was not the first flood. It was the second flood. Okay? Adam and Eve are not created until Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. The Bible does not say Adam and Eve were the first man and woman created by God. It says they were the first man and woman created in the image and likeness of God. The implication is that the first civilization was not in the image and likeness of God, nor ordained by God, because they were continually evil in all of their ways. They were not created by God. God was not going to participate in their creation. He was not going to give them a spirit man because the spirit man is his image. And if God gave them a spirit man, he would be acknowledging that his image was evil. Huh? No way. No way. Next slide, please. So what happened? The real story of Satan, Adam, and Eve, letting Scripture interpret Scripture. Let's see what actually happened and how Satan did not give up his battle and wanted to continue 
to alter genetically the DNA of God's creation. Well, here's what happened. First, we've got to understand some terminologies. Let's look at the term sons of God. This is mentioned in Enoch chapter 7, which was once part of the Old Testament, since been removed. Genesis 6-4, Job 1-6. The sons of God are the Hebrew, the Benai Elohim, which means the watchers or the fallen ones, or literally those who came down or fell from the heavens. There is no evidence in Scripture that this term ever refers to good angels. A lot of people want to make the case or the argument that the sons of God refers to good angels. No. The Bible has a very specific term for the holy angels of God. The angels of God are referred to by Scripture as holy angels repeatedly. Matthew 25, 31, Mark 8, 38, Luke 9, 26, Revelations 14, 10. When the good angels are referred to in Scripture, they are referred to as the holy angels. Now, watch this. In Job 1.6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. In other words, Satan was a watcher. Why? Because the sons of God, okay, Look at what it says here. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. The Benai Elohim, the sons of God, the watchers, came to present themselves before God. And it says, Satan was among them. Guess what? He was a watcher. Also, he was a watcher. Now, why were they called watchers? Because they watched women and lusted after them. That's why. Why is this important? What did we learn about what the watchers did in Genesis 6? They took to themselves wives, kidnapping, whomever they pleased, uh, I'm sorry, abduction, whomever they pleased, kidnapping, and had children by them. Rape. Huh? And Satan is a watcher. What is his ministry? Same ministry. Every seed reproduces after its own kind. Law of Genesis. Are you all following? Okay. Now watch what happens because of this. Okay. Go to the next slide, please. So what did the watchers do? 6-4, Genesis, the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bare children by them. That's seduction and rape. Now, what did Satan really do to Adam and Eve? Okay, number one, first question. Was Abel from Adam, and where did Cain come from? Why is this important to answer this question? Where did Adam, where did Abel come from? And where did Cain come from? Why is this so important? For this reason, Genesis 5. The book of the generations of Adam says in verse 3, And Adam begat or had a son in his own likeness, in his own likeness, after his own image, and he called his name Seth. Adam's generations begin with Seth. Abel, whom Jesus referred to as righteous Abel, is not mentioned, although the offspring of Adam and Eve. Why? Because he never produced generations. It says this is the book of the generations. Abel never produced generations, so he's not mentioned. Does that make sense? Okay. He's not mentioned. All right. However, Seth was generated as the first son of Adam and Eve. That generated. 
He is the first son of Adam and Eve that generated. So what do we see here? We see that Cain and Abel are born to Eve, but the book of generations in Genesis chapter 5 verse 3 says that Adam begot a son in his own image and likeness, after his own image, called his name Seth. So Adam's generations and Eve's generations begin with Seth. Ooh, what happened to Cain and Abel? Interesting question. Let's look at it. Now, so we know that Abel, or A Abel was never mentioned, even though Jesus said he was righteous, and he was a son of Eve because he never got to generate. This is the book of generations. Why? He never produced generations because Cain murdered him. But what about Cain? That's the real question. What about Cain? Now watch this. There's a law you're going to have to remember, which we call the law of Genesis. Every seed reproduces after its own kind. Genesis 3. Keep this in mind now and watch what happens. Here's a very interesting narrative. The mystery begins in Genesis 4, verse 1 and 2. Genesis 4, verse 1 and 2. It reads, And Adam knew, or had sexual relations with his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man-child from the Lord. And she again, again, bare his brother Abel. This word again means that Abel and Cain were born at the same time. They were twins. They were born at the same time. They were twins. Now, notice that she said, I have gotten a man-child from the Lord. She thought that she had had sex with God. She thought it was God that she was having relationships with, that she was permitting to enter into her. And I'm going to prove that to you momentarily. And as a consequence, okay, it was someone else. As a consequence, she had Cain and she had Abel. Next slide. Now let's examine these verses from the literal concordant Hebrew version of the Bible. We're going to go directly from the Hebrew now, okay? And here's what it said. And the human knows Eve, his wife, and pregnant is she, and is bearing Cain. And saying is she, I acquire a man, Yahweh. Why does she say Yahweh? Because every seed reproduces after its own kind, and she recognizes this child as Yahweh, so it had to be Yahweh who gave it to her. That's what the real Hebrew says. Okay? And proceeding at the same time, is she to bear his brother Abel? Now, watch this. One. Eve proceeded to have Abel at the same time. That is, Cain and Abel were twins, but what kind? Identical or fraternal? Let's investigate. Eve's confession. Now watch this. First she said, now listen up, listen up, this is important. First she says, first she says, I have, re I have gotten a man-child from the Lord. Okay? Now watch this. When God asks her, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And watch what she says. Now she changes her mind. She no longer says, I received a man-child from the Lord. Watch what she says. She says, 
the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Uh-oh. Big revelation coming up. The serpent, Satan, beguiled me. This word in the Hebrew, beguiled, is the Hebrew word nasha. And watch this. Its literal meaning is to lure or seduce fully, meaning body, mind, spirit, and sexually. That is the literal translation of nasha. It always implies sexual seduction. Sexual seduction. You can ask any rabbi, and any rabbi will tell you that nasha, uh, Im, that nasha implies a total seduction, including sexual. This word then, when used in the Hebrew, always carries with it a sexual connotation. She further confessed, I did eat. This Hebrew word, akal, means I did participate, I did devour what he offered. So, I have acquired a man-child from the Lord, is what she said originally. She thought she had relations with the Lord. Then confessed her beguilement, her Put it, she was put under a spell of witchcraft by Satan, by the serpent, bewitchment. Next slide. Now, then watch this. Oh, it's another, it's another thing also. I, I, I have to say one more thing. Then when God asked them, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree? And she just admitted to God, I did eat. I, Satan beguiled me, and I did eat. He put me under a spell, and I did eat. But, but the verse continues, and, and uh, Abel says, and I did eat. I participated. Now, what does that mean? That means that they had a sexual threesome. That's what it means. Cain, or, or not Cain, uh, Adam, Eve, and Satan had a sexual threesome. And I'll show you that momentarily. Cain killed Abel. He was the first murderer. Jesus said that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. Cain had Satan's genetic makeup and ministry. Cain was satanic seed line according to the law of Genesis. Satan comes to kill, steal, destroy, John 10.10. 10. Abel was called righteous by Jesus, not of Satan, but of Adam. Question, how could Eve deliver twins, one evil and one righteous? Answer, Cain and Abel were not identical twins, but fraternal twins. Now, here's a couple of medical facts. Identical twins come from a single egg and a single sperm, and the egg fertilizes and then splits, doubling its chromosomes, and you get two identical persons. Fraternal twins come from two separate eggs and two different sperm, fertilizing two separate eggs. Those two sperm either come from the same father or from the father and another donor whose relation or has relations occurring at the same time or very closely apart. That's what happened with Adam and Satan. They were closely apart, having sexual relations with Eve, and one had the relation right after the other. Okay? And two eggs were fertilized. Both Adam and Eve confessed, I did eat, I participated. That confirms how those two eggs could be fertilized. And we know that Satan participated. Why? Because Cain had the ministry of Satan, murder. 
Therefore, the implication of Scripture is that Satan arranged what the French call a menage a trois, or a sexual threesome, and two different sperm-fertilized eggs, Eve's eggs. Go ahead. What is the conclusion? What did the watchers, the sons of God, do? They seduced and raped women. What did Satan do? He seduced and raped Eve and Adam. Why? Satan has the same ministry as the other watchers because he is a watcher also. Every seed reproduces after its own kind. What was the purpose? One, to kill Abel to stop the righteous seed line through Adam and Eve from developing. See, what is he doing? Notice now, Satan is constantly going after the DNA. Kill the DNA or disrupt it or corrupt it. Always after the DNA. Huh? Two, to begin a satanic seed line through the Nephilim to populate the entire world as at the same time as at the same time of the pre Adamic civilization. Satan wanted a seed line of his own. Huh? Why? To defile, they would intermingle, they would uh, cohabitate with the seed line of Eve, pollute the seed line of Eve, dilute the seed line of Eve, profane the seed line of Eve, corrupt the seed line of Eve, so there would be no suitable vessel for Jesus to incarnate into, to stop Messiah's coming. Okay? Three to genetically disrupt, defile, and crossbreed hybrids of God's entire creation to steal God's glory. That was his plan. Next. Now let's look at some more terminology. The watchers, the sons of God, also referred to as the Grigori in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. So the word Grigori, or the word Gibberim, the mighty men, or the word Nephilim, these three words all mean the same thing. They all mean the, uh, the Nephilim or the giants. I'm sorry. They all, uh, the Nephilim are not the watchers. I take that back. The Grigori are the watchers. The Nephilim and the Gibberim are the uh, uh, are the giants? They mean the same thing. I stand correct. Nephilim, the offspring of the union of the sons of God with the daughters of men, angel men, if you will. That is, they have the appearance of men, but the soul, life, and intellect of fallen angels. The singular form of Nephilim. Nephilim is plural. Men, fallen men. The singular is nephil or nephil. The gibberim, mighty men or mighty ones, another term for the nephilim, offspring and their descendants. Next. Let's look at the nephilim history on the earth. Satan's seduction of Adam and Eve was for the purpose of producing a seed line unto himself. Now, how do we know that? God said it himself. In Genesis 3.15, notice what God said to Satan. And I will put enmity, I will put strife between you and the woman and between your seed, Satan, and her seed. Her seed, Eve's seed, gave rise to the believers. Satan's seed gave rise to the unbelievers and the uh uh, aliens that are not of God. So, God said there would be two seed lines on the earth. That's Genesis 3.15. God said, Satan, you'll have a seed line, and the woman will have a seed line, and I will put strife between the two seed lines. Okay? God acknowledged that Satan would have a seed line on the earth. Next slide. Although destroyed from the earth in the first flood, the pre-Adamic civilization, 
Scripture says that the world became totally corrupted again at the time of Noah. What happened? Something happened. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. That's Genesis 6, 5, 8, and 9. This verse tells us that there was a second Nephilim invasion of the earth and that they had fully established themselves on the planet fully at the time of Noah. How did they get back on the earth? That's the next question to answer. If God had destroyed them all before the creation of Adam and Eve, how did they get back and fully populate the earth again at the time of Noah? Next slide. The answer, they returned to the earth by spaceships. The fact that God destroyed all on the earth and the fact that they showed up upon the earth again implies that not all the Nephilim were on the earth. Only those on the earth were destroyed. They had angelic intelligence, and therefore they had a knowledge of physics, chemistry, mathematics, astronomy, engineering, and had colonized the planets millions of years ago. After the annihilation of the first civilization, they were determined to come back and reestablish themselves, which they did at the time of Noah. The Nephilim history on the earth. Now, Scripture said Noah was pure in his generations. What does that mean? It means that only his DNA was not altered by the watchers or the Nephilim. They could not touch his DNA. He was under the law of Genesis. But notice what happened to his three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem. Japheth became the father of the white races. Ham became the father of the black races. Shem became the father of the oriental or the yellow races. Now, let me ask you a question. If Noah was pure in his generations, that is, his DNA was not altered or tampered with by Satan or the Nephilim, then how in the world, if he had pure DNA... How in the world could he end up having one white son, one black son, and one yellow son? How in the world? Well, the answer to that is that it didn't come from him. The DNA came from his wife. And her and she was genetically altered physically. Say. Okay, due to Nephilim tampering with her family line. These DNA alterations express themselves through Japheth, Ham, and Seth. So Noah's wife was a crossbreed or a hybrid. That's why. That's how that happened. Okay? Now watch this. This is proof that mankind as it is today, why? Because we are all descendants of Noah, aren't we? Through either Ham, Japheth, or Shem. And that is the proof that mankind as it is today has been genetically altered physically, although remaining seed of Eve spiritually. And those called out ones remain seed of God through the born-again experience. Now you know why the New Testament Scripture says not you are a new creation. It says you are a new creature. Why are we a new creature? Because the old creature has been genetically corrupted. That's why. We are a new creature. Because the old creature is genetically corrupted. 
What does that mean? We have the DNA of God. When? When we take possession of it. When? When we get rid of all of Satan's uh, DNA that he overrode on our DNA. The DNA scripts that he wrote through sin and generations curses. Which is why we break them, uh, destroy the portals and the connections with the soul man established through them, and cast down the thrones and the cherubim and the dominions and the seraphim that gave the orders to the principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits in high places, pulling down the entire stronghold. At whose direction? Jesus' direction. Well, where's all that in the Scripture, Burn, I'm glad you asked. It's Matthew 12, 29. How can one pillage, how can one tear down the strong man's house unless he first bind the strong man? Who are the strong men? Satan, the fallen cherubims, the fallen seraphims, the fallen thrones, the fallen dominions, the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness, the wicked spirits in high places, the strong men on assignment to the individual, and all above, around, and below that are governing his life. They are the strong man. There is a legal right for us to tear them down and destroy them in the name of and by the blood of Christ Jesus to the glory of the Father in Christ Jesus' name. Now, the Nephilim is God's response at the time of Noah to destroy all the earth except Noah and his family. Now, isn't that grace? Even though, even though Noah's family were hybrids, his sons were hybrids, huh? He didn't destroy them, although he destroyed all the rest of the Nephilim. What is that? That's grace, showing you grace is still operational in the Old Testament. Stop keeping the law. God's way is not law. Stop keeping the traditions. God's way is not traditions. Jesus said in Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John, until John, until John. What is God saying? It's over with. It's fulfilled in me. You don't need that anymore. The law and the prophets were until John. And now, listen to the words, and now the kingdom is preached, and many there are who are pressing in. What does God want us to be doing now? Turn away from the old Turn only to the new. Press in. Press in. Why? Because you are of another priesthood than the Old Testament priesthoods. All Old Testament priesthoods were priesthoods after the flesh. You are of the priesthood of Melchizedek because you are a son of God. And the son of God is high priest according to the priesthood of uh, the uh, the priesthood of Melchizedek, huh? Which is what priest after an endless life. Who is Melchizedek? The Holy Spirit, huh? So it's the only priesthood of Scripture that is the priesthood after an endless life, not after the flesh. And we are of that priesthood. So what does that mean? That is a priesthood of the kingdom. All the other priesthoods were priesthoods of the earth. This is a priesthood of the kingdom. So Jesus says, leave the old behind, press into the new. Jesus preached the kingdom. See? Now the next question you're going to ask me is, then why when he was on the earth did he, uh, did he keep the law? He kept the law because it was before he went to the cross. Notice that after he resurrected, he did not keep the law. He did not keep the law after he resurrected. He was preaching kingdom, 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 kingdom. Before, before he 
was crucified, he kept the law even though he was preaching the kingdom. Why did he keep the law? Because he was called to the Jew first and then the Gentile. To the Jew first. So he was doing it to minister to them, to show him that he was the fulfillment of what they were trying to keep. It was his witness to them. That's why. And as soon as the crucifixion took place, guess what? The, the dispensation of the law ended and the dispensation of grace was officially restored. Amen? Not begun, I said restored. Why? Because Abraham was under grace by faith, and so were all those under the Old Testament. They just didn't know it. Uh, go back Go back there for a moment. Um, okay, so what's the conclusion? God's prescription for every man, woman, and child, Nephilim, is death. No exceptions. They do not love the Lord, and they are not called according to his purpose. Okay, next. Now, watch this. So, at the time of the second flood of Noah, they were all wiped out except Noah's sons in Noah, huh? And now we look, and guess what happens after the second flood? They're again seen on the earth in Joshua. Joshua sent spies into Canaan. They returned with this report. There we, there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. In other words, they're the descendants of the Nephilim. New, Numbers 13, 33. And then in 2 Samuel 23, 20, and Benaiah, the son of Jehadiah, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-faced men of Moab. What does that mean? They had two lion-faced men. They were genetic Nephilim hybrids. Hybrids are mentioned in Scripture. 2 Samuel 23.20 David encountered the giant Goliath. He was of the Nephilim. In 1 Samuel 17, 4, we read, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. D, after the flood, Scripture says that Ham begot Cush, and Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one, a gibber. Remember, gibberim and Nephilim are the same thing. Nimrod was a giant in the earth. Proof that it came down on him through his great-grandmother, Noah's wife. His wife was uh, the one whose genes were altered, Noah's uh, wife. And Nimrod was her great-grandson. Next. After Nimrod, the Nephilim began to multiply again upon the earth. They directed their first major efforts at the inhabitation of Canaan because they knew that this was to be the home of the Israelites and the Jewish nation. They would try to bring wars against the Hebrews to annihilate the population, again to prevent Messiah from coming. The Bible speaks of seven tribes of giants, the Nephilim, the Zamzumim, the Anakim, the Emim, the Zuzim, the Rephaim and the Seraphim. Next. But the Nephilim did not stop just with defiling mankind. The book of Enoch tells us that they went on to defile the whole creation. Uh-oh. Notice what it says in Enoch chapter 7, verse 10 to 14. Then they took wives, each choosing for himself, whom they began to approach, and with whom they cohabitated, teaching them sorcery, incantations, dividing of roots, trees, herbalisms. And they conceived and brought forth giants whose stature was each 300 cubits. 
These uh, devoured all which uh, the labor of men produced until it became impossible to feed them. And they began to injure birds and beasts and reptiles and fishes and to eat their own flesh one after the other. In other words, they were cannibals. And to drink their own blood. They were vampires. They were cannibalistic and they were vampiric in their behavior. Notice that this is Enoch chapter 7, 10, and 14. This is the same things that Matthew 24, verse 37 to 39 says. Notice the close correlation of the book of Enoch with the New Testament scriptures. Next. Archaeologists have found Sumerian clay cylinders with written history in which the Sumerians claimed that their culture was founded by the Anunnaki. These are the Anakim of the Bible who came down from the stars to teach them. Historically, the Sumerian culture bloomed almost overnight. Among the gods that they worshipped were the hybrids Lilith, queen of vampires and witches, half woman, half owl. She had four daughter goddesses, the Lilan, named the Incubus Succubus, shape changer demons, the Satyr upper torso of a man, lower body of a goat, the Satyr, the Lamia, the upper torso of a woman, the lower torso of a snake, the Empusa, the upper body of a woman, the lower body of a goat. The historical picture is that of hybrid beings with whom the ancients became familiar and worshipped them as gods. They actually existed. They were offspring of Nephilim crossbreeding with humans and animals. They did not stop crossbreeding with humans. They went on, the scripture says, to animals. Okay, and by the way, Paul talks about this in the New Testament in Romans chapter 1. I'll show you momentarily and then we'll close. Next. Okay. They proceed to spread throughout the earth and became known worldwide for their evil, leaving a record of written and oral traditions in almost all cultures. Now, we read Genesis 4. There were giants in the earth in that day. Okay. Notice that at the end it says they were men of renown. That is, they were known worldwide, not only for their size, but for their evil. Not all were giants physically, but all were giants in pride, violence, arrogance, lawlessness, and mentally. Go ahead. Among the more prominent cultures who knew and worshipped the gods, part man, part beast, were the Sumerians, who worshipped the Anunnaki, the Egyptians, who worshipped Horus, Isis, and Sed, the Greeks, who worshipped the Cyclops, the Minotaur, the Medusa, the gods of Mount Olympus, Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite, and the Titans, the Romans, the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Incans, the Hopi, Indi Hopi Indians of America, and other Native American tribes. Next. That the Nephilim would return is prophesied in Scripture. There are actual Scripture prophecies of the end time that, that tell you that the Nephilim are coming back. And I have news for you. They are already here. There is a video of them on YouTube. You can see it with your own eyes. Go to YouTube and in the search engine, plug in the words Giants Peru. And a video will come up where you will see two giants on a hill stand up. And when they stand up, the top of the trees are at their waistline. They have already returned. They're in hiding. Watch this. How do we know that they're going to come back? How do we know they're going to come back? Pay attention to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 19, 9 to 11. Here's what it says. 
And the thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It has already been of old time. Old time refers to the pre-Adamic civilization. It already has been of old time. Now you know why I said there once was a Los Angeles. There once was a New York. There once was a San Francisco. It already has been of old time. There is nothing new under the sun. Neither shall... There is no remembrance of former things. That is, there is no remembrance of the pre-Adamic civilization. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. What does that mean? Who are those that shall come after? Us. Okay? And when it's all over, there will not be any mem remembrance by us of those things that are to come, which are what? The return of the Nephilim. They're going to come back, but God's going to do away with them. And just as we no longer remember the pre-Adamic civilization, we will no longer remember them when they come back this time. They will all be destroyed also. God's prescription is always death. Okay? So, keep in mind uh, that this is a prophetic verse that they will return. Next verse. <clears throat> now, here is the actual verse that they are going to come back. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 3, 5, and 9. <clears throat> 3, 5, and 9. And we're going to stop here for today. This is the last verse for today. Okay, just so that you know that what I am preaching and teaching is all truth. I have shown you from before Adam and Eve to the present how we get to this prophecy. And you will see that it's true. Isaiah 13, verse 3, 5, and 9 says this. I have commanded my sanctified ones, the angels, I have called my mighty ones. Remember, Gibberim and Nephilim mean the same thing. The giants. For mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. That's referring to his angels. They come from a far country. Now watch this. They come from the end of the heavens. They come from outer space. They come from outer space. I have called them back from outer space. Are you wondering why so many people are seeing UFOs? Now you have the answer. They are not friendly, folks. Don't be deceived. They are the descendants of the Nephilim. And how do we know? Because... Millions of people who have experienced abductions say that they were taken against their will. That's abduction. That they were brought onto uh, UFOs. Uh, that's kidnapping. And that they, were, they had eggs or semen removed from them. That's rape. Remember what the ministry of the Watchers was? Abduction, kidnapping, and rape of the women they cohabitated with? Now, what are the aliens in UFO doing? Abduction, kidnapping, and rape. Do you remember the law of Genesis? Every seed reproduces after its own kind. Who can these be then? that are in these UFOs doing these things, operating in the same seed line, doing the same thing hereditarily as the Watchers. It's the offspring descendants of the Nephilim. They are back. 
Why? As a judgment upon the earth for unbelievers, as a judgment upon the earth for rebellion because God said he would call them back. I have commanded, he says, they come from a far country, from the end of the heavens, that's from outer space, I, even the Lord, and the weapons of his indignation to destroy, they are the weapons of his anger, to destroy the whole land. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Now, there are three elements of this prophecy which you must understand. Three elements of this prophecy that you must understand. The first element, mighty ones are coming. Notice, I have called my mighty ones. They come. Mighty ones are coming. Guess what? They are already here. Two, they are coming from the ends of the heavens, which means what? From outer space. Three, they are coming in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord cometh. Behold, watch, the day of the Lord cometh. When? In the end times. The Septuagint translation, the Greek Old Testament says, Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. What does this all mean, folks? What it means is they are already here. And you can see them on YouTube. Amen? Let's stop there for today. Father, we give you thanks, praise, and glory for the revelation of your word that you unveil to us the nature of the war of the ages, that you have demonstrated so clearly to us the importance that you put on DNA and seed lines. Father, I would ask you to wake the churches up and to show them that DNA is all over the Bible. Wherever in the Bible the word seed or seed line appears, it is referring to DNA in a language of 2,000 years ago in the New Testament to a language of 6,000 years ago in the Old Testament. They didn't have specific words, scientific words, in that day and age. But they knew what they were talking about because all that the plant is, is in the seed, and the seed is DNA. The seed is DNA. That's what it's all about. And so we thank you, Lord, that you bring forth this wisdom and knowledge to show us what is going on. And we bless your name, and we give you all the glory, Lord. Lord, even so more, we give you the thanks and praise and glory that just as you made a way out for Noah and his loved ones, you make a way out for us. Because it is historically documented in the Scripture, in the Bible, that whenever you brought judgment against an unholy nation or an unholy world, you always got the believer, the seed line of Eve, out of the way. We give you thanks, praise, and glory. We give you thanks, praise, and glory. We give you thanks, praise, and glory, Lord. We adore you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. We bless your name, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the praise. In fact, you even tell us, Lord, you even tell us in your word to ask to be taken out of the way. In Luke 21, 36, you say, pray 
that you may be made able to escape all that is about to come to pass upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. <clears throat> and I've got news for you folks. The word pray is Old English for ask. That's what it means in modern English. Ask that you may be made able to escape all that is about to come to pass upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. <laughs> Isn't that something? God says ask. Now, why do you think God says ask? Well, I've got news for you. Jeremiah 1.12, in Jeremiah 1.12, God says, I am watching over my word to perform it. Huh? I am watching over my word to perform it. So God says in Luke 21.36, Ask that you may be made able to escape all that is about to come to pass upon the earth. Huh? Ask, and why does he say that? Well, if he's watching over his word to perform it, watch this. He says in Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, and you shall receive. God performs his word. If I ask, I shall receive. If I ask to be made able to escape all that is about to come to pass upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man, I shall receive what I ask because that's a promise of God to me. And the scripture says in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he should lie. Amen? So Jesus says, when you see all of these things come to pass, look up because your redemption is near. Amen? Amen. Give God the glory. Amen. <laughs> We want to thank the members of our radio listening audience uh, for tuning in. You've been listening to the Sunday morning service coming to you here from Miami, Florida. We hope that you'll tune in and join us again next week at the same time. Uh, and until then, God bless you. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Let me put, before we do this, let me uh, let me say something to a, a lot of the young folks here, okay? A lot of the young folks see all of this thing coming down on us, and they get this idea: "Gee, I don't have a future here. What is there here for me? What's going to happen? You know, I got things I'd like to do. I'd like to experience my life, etc." Okay, here's my answer to all of you young folks: Jesus knows that. And he says in the scripture, until I come, he says in the Gospels, keep doing what you're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep pressing in. Okay, why? Because even though there's going to be a rapture, okay, it's only temporary. All right, it's only temporary. And we're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. But then we're all coming back. And we're going to be here on the earth a thousand years with Jesus to restore the earth. huh? And, why, and, and when we are here, everybody is going to be able to pick up on, with their life where they left off. And you're going to be able to continue to pursue, you know, your futures. Okay? And that's why Jesus said in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you plans for good and not to harm you, to give you a 